So I recently came across a new video of Kyle Hill called The Lear Radiological Accident and I became kind of curious so I thought it would be interesting to check it out together with you guys. I will leave a link to the original video in the description down below and without further ado, let's get into it. December 2nd, 2001 was a cold, snowy day in Lea, a village in the European country of Georgia. 50 kilometers to the east, among the trees along a nearly impassable mountain road, three men were out searching. Some IAA footage, International Atomic Energy Agency. Let's see what the Lea accident is about. Never heard about it, actually. For firewood, it was getting dark when they happened across a bizarre sight. Two small cylinders that, despite the snowfall, were perfectly uncovered. In fact, Underneath each container was a circle of soggy ground that was steaming. It was too late to turn back, so they decided to spend the night in the forest using these curious objects as personal heaters. Oh, wow. Soon afterwards, all three men would end up in hospitals for up to two years, and one man never left. This is the true story of the radiological accident in Leah, Georgia. What happened? Did they dump some waste? But it looked like a large cylinder, so it's not like a fuel assembly or a fuel rod or anything like that. I'm curious now, even more. In the early 1980s, the country of Georgia was well on its way to producing the vast majority of its electricity via hydroelectric dams. The Kodoni Dam... Go Georgia! Nice with the hydropower. I support that. ...was under construction, waiting to be connected by radio relay stations to the Nguri Dam a few dozen kilometers away. This remote effort wouldn't have any reliable access to electricity, so in 1983, the Soviet Union, of which Georgia was a member, manufactured eight radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs, vessels that carry extremely radioactive sources that can generate electricity through radioactive decay alone. Only in the Soviet Union would some person come up with a radioactive heater. I'm quite surprised that this is the first time I hear about it. These were to power the remote relay stations. But before the RTGs could be installed, Georgian independence and the fall of the Soviet Union intervened. The Kodoni Dam was temporarily abandoned, as were the eight sources of incredible radiation. Of the eight Soviet RTGs, two are lost to this day. Two were recovered in 1998 without incident, two more in 1999, again safely. The remaining two RTGs were found in 2000. So they kind of lost them, all eight, and then they found two, and then they found another two, and then some men found the last two just lying in the forest. I don't get it. How is the falling off the Soviet Union and the independence of Georgia made radioactive heat sources to be lost? 2001, not by soldiers or specialists, but by three men by looking to stay warm in the snow-covered forests 50 kilometers east of Leah. December 2nd, 2001. Three Lea men were driving their truck in mountainous terrain made nearly impassable by snowfall. Near the end of the day, their quest for firewood had led them to something out of place. Two metal cylinders laying on the path in front of them. Unlike the surrounding woods, the ground around these cylinders was snow-free and steaming. Whatever was creating the steam and the heat was invisible. It was around 6 p.m. and it was getting dark. Rather than make the many-hour trek back to Leah, the three men decided to make camp in the forest and use the curious cylinders as personal heaters to make it through what would be a frigid night. Wow. One man picked up a cylinder and dropped it immediately. It was too hot to touch and confusingly heavy for its small size. Instead of abandoning the abandoned too heavy for its size, too hard to touch, just radioactive. I don't understand. <laughs> what were these people thinking about these heaters? It's like basically fissioning material in a small container. What if it came in contact with water, for example? Wasn't there a fear or a possibility or risk for it to go critical? And devices. The men fashion a thick wire into something that can move the cylinders without touching them, drag them to a rocky outcrop that would serve as camp, and lit a fire. The next few hours were uneventful. The men ate dinner and drank vodka, their backs to and touching the Soviet RTGs still radiating what was to them an unexplainable but beneficial amount of heat. Three hours later, they all started vomiting. Their stomachs, combined with nausea, dizziness, and headaches, 
would make for a terrible night's sleep. The next morning, they were exhausted and loaded up only half the firewood they had gathered into their truck. Still not concerned with the invisible heat from the cylinders, two of the men made holders to carry them on their backs for hours as they worked. But the men eventually decided to leave the cylinders behind. They navigated the treacherous roads and returned home to Leah. Their symptoms persisted for days, but the men told no one. It wasn't Blood. until three weeks later, on the 22nd of December, that their Blood clouds on the tongue. Wow, this is crazy. Families told the local police about their declining conditions. All three men were hospitalized the same day. A radioisotope thermoelectric generator is a relatively simple piece of nuclear technology. It only needs two things. A so oh, it's plutonium what they were using. Interesting. I still cannot believe they were actually making such things. Where was I when this was happening? Probably way too young. Wow. A radioactive heat generator from the country that brought you Chernobyl. Source of radioactivity like plutonium and a way to turn decay heat into electricity. Invented in 1954, an RTG uses technology called a thermocouple that, with a difference in temperature across it, generates electricity. It's not a lot of power, but with no moving parts and long fuel half-lives, RTGs are perfect for remote or extreme environments that only need small outputs for very long periods of time. Yeah, that I understand. Or generally, the benefit of some radioactive element that produces heat and the heat to be used for something else instead of just lying around, you know, for with no purpose. I get that. But how is that not even, I don't know, controlled or protected in any way or they didn't even make the people aware of that and nobody knew about that. So you just dump it in the middle of the field and then all of a sudden the Soviet Union falls apart and then here you have eight radioactive heaters. <laughs> what? Most RTGs are on spacecraft yeah. or in remote areas like the Arctic. The Soviet Union use RTGs filled with strontium-90 to power uncrewed lighthouses and navigational beacons all across its territory. But when the Union collapsed in 1991, it left behind approximately 1,000 RTGs. Wow. So they didn't even consider collecting them or at least informing people that they are there. Protection or warning signs. Without warning signs. Without protection and without even a warning sign that is radioactive. Any of them are still unaccounted for today. Many are still unaccounted for today. Wow, this is insane. I don't even understand how that happened. I'm assuming that the people who placed them, who made them, who distributed them, nobody was held accountable, nobody went to jail, nobody was called forward to actually, you know, locate these uh, heaters and contain them or at least inform the people that they are there and what needs to be done for them to not have radiation poisoning and uh, sickness like the people in Georgia have. A little over a year after the cylinders were first discovered, while the anonymous men were still being treated in hospitals, the International Atomic Energy Agency answered the Georgian government's request for help in recovering what were now known to be two abandoned Soviet RTGs. And they got everything on video. This incredible footage, shot by the IAEA in 2002, captures the training that prepared the participants for recovery, the recovery of the RTGs, and the medical consequences of using strontium-90 as a personal space heater. Most stories like this are never shown in this detail publicly, so consider the footage throughout the rest of this video invaluable in both its rarity and its ability to show you how to successfully deal with a radiological incident and its aftermath. By late January 2002, the IAEA had visited the site, examined the overexposed wood gatherers, and come up with a plan. Build a special five and a half ton lead transport container to hold the two radioactive sources. Imagine five and a half tons of lead container to hold the two sources, which the people were lying their backs against in order to be uh, warm throughout the, that winter night that they spent in the woods. That's insane. Manufacture tools specific for the operation and its location. Adapt an old army truck to move the special container and train 26 individuals and 26 backups in the proper recovery of radioactive sources. This training would be critical as the RTGs and the strontium-90 inside were so hot that no individual would be allowed to spend more than 40 seconds near them during the entire mission. This was non-negotiable. 
a whole body dose of five sieverts brings with it a 50% chance of death. The radiation emitted at the surface of the sword. So usually 10 sieverts is what's considered to be a lethal dose. So yeah, I guess five sieverts would be 50% death to the whole body. This was almost five sieverts per hour. Wow. Recovery officially began after IAEA scouting of the area on the 2nd of February, 2002. The 18 kilometers the recovery team traveled from a nearby village was a slog of mud, snow, and unmaintained roads that took three and a half hours to navigate. The path was only passable with the help of a towing tractor provided by local authorities. The agency wanted to avoid these harsh conditions and leave the isolated canisters alone until the spring where they wouldn't be hurting anybody, but fear from the local population and the government of Georgia pressed them forward. Once on site, the mission would last just an hour, thanks to the strict adherence to the two critical principles of nuclear safety. Nuclear physics is complicated, but personal nuclear safety is extremely simple. TDS, time distance shielding. Whatever is source. That is basically the three things that uh, the dose that the person will receive depends on how much time you spend next to the radioactive source, how close you are to it, and if there's any shielding between you and the source, because the source can emit uh, all kinds of uh, radiation, for example, alpha, beta, gamma, X-rays, and uh, gamma rays or anything else. And uh, with proper shielding, you can avoid, for example, the alpha particles to reach the body. And with uh, <clears throat> more shielding, you can avoid the beta, the gamma, and the X-rays you cannot really avoid, but you of course, need to know what are the uh, radiation that uh, what is the radiation that the source is emitting and how to handle it properly. <clears throat> is emitting it's constant, so the less time you spend near it, the less dose you're going to receive. Radioactivity, like light, spreads out in every direction and decreases rapidly with distance, so every meter you're from it matters. Finally, radiation can be attenuated or outright stopped exactly. as it passes through matter. So get anything between you and a source. The least time, the most distance, and the most shielding will keep you as safe as possible if you must be near a radioactive source. Simple rules, but powerful. The first time I heard about this principle was from a man who used it to photograph the elephant's foot beneath a Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The second principle of nuclear safety is ALARA, or as low as reasonably achievable. If you have to work with radiation, you endeavor to do all you can through TDS to receive the lowest dose achievable for the work. You don't linger, you don't take chances, you don't do anything that you don't absolutely have to. This is why you see the IAEA trained workers here literally running away from the sources. When working with something that hot, every meter and every second counts. Once everything was in place, once the calculations were done, the lead container prepped, and the movements of workers according to dose limits planned, recovery commenced. The I like how they actually made the whole schematic of the, of the area and the sources and stuff, that's very nice. And actually you can see the, the doses that you get in the distances. So for example, very close to it, I see 5 meters away, 1.3 millisieverts. 10 meters away, something like 90 mic uh, microsievert. And then very close to it, is it the 430 micron? And further away is like 50 micron. Wow, that is a lot. If I'm not mistaken, when I showed the video from the lab and the natural uranium rod that I measured with the Geiger, uh, that must have been something like 0.5 millisieverts per hour. So 0.5 millisieverts per hour, mm, yeah, orders of magnitude lower than than what these people were exposed to. Following is the actual footage of the operation. Listen to the workers call out time limits. Point out shielding they can use. Stay behind the rock. Here, the ticking radiation counters. Get away, not the door, he's going to run up. Run this way, this Stop, way, oh, this oh, way. Notice the steam coming from the sources, still hot enough to melt the surrounding snow.
Within just 20 minutes, both sources were contained. An excellent example of how to recover a dangerous orphan source quickly and with severely limited financial and technical resources. No recovery worker received more than 1.16 millisieverts of radiation, less than 10% of the dose you'd get from a CT scan. The mission was a great success. But the three men who first found the abandoned generators were not so lucky. After they were hospitalized in the December of 2001, the three Leah men, now patients, would be moved around hospitals in Georgia, Russia, and France, and would receive extensive treatment. Patient three was the luckiest. He received burns on his legs and hands, but was discharged after only a month of treatment. Okay. Patients one and two would need treatment for up to two years. A full body dose of 10 grays, another unit of absorbed ionizing dose, is 99% fatal. A dose of six grays is lethal for 50% of those that receive it, and 5% of people will die after receiving two grays. Patients one and two had received estimated doses between one and six grays, meaning that any road to recovery could be impassable. A self-contained radioactive source that is no longer under proper regulatory control and poses an immediate radiological threat is called an orphan source. They can be anything from an abandoned RTG to a medical imaging device to a nuclear warhead. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has estimated that at least one device like this becomes an orphan source in the United States every day. The improper handling or control of orphan sources What? Even like nowadays? ...has directly killed people all over the world and caused many millions of dollars in damages. Yeah, well, no wonder people are afraid of nuclear. If there is people who treat nuclear like this, then I also would have wanted, you know? If they cannot properly handle it, contain it, inform people about it, then of course people would not want it anywhere near them. I don't even blame them. The identification of orphan sources and their collection is therefore critical to any country's comprehensive nuclear safety program. Exactly. In 2003, the same year patient two was finally discharged from the hospital, the IAEA went back to Georgia looking for more orphan sources just in case. And they found another 300 of them. What? 300? How? That's like 2003, that's like 20 years ago. It's not even like in the 70s, 60s or more, I don't know, back in the days that people didn't really know much about nuclear. 2003, you already have a pretty established and good image of what's happening and what nuclear is. I, I still cannot comprehend it. I'm actually in shock. Like, I have no words. For what we just watched, I have no words. To be honest, I had no idea of the Leah accident. I had no idea that 300 orphan sources were found in Georgia after that. And that how many did he say are being lost in the US every day? I start seeing the problem now, you know? Wow. Well, I will do definitely some more digging into this information. Uh, as always, uh, Kyle's video are very interesting, very informative. So many new things, even for me, uh, as I said. This is a completely new area that I have never explored before. Um, so thanks to him and uh, to the great team that he has to make such video. I will definitely go check out the IAA original footage and uh, get some more insight on the accident and how it happened. And most importantly, what were the aftermath? What was the aftermath after it? Because I think that's what's more curious to me and more interesting to see how they handled the, the rest of the sources and generally the whole situation, who was held accountable for it and stuff like that. So yeah, let me know what you think in the comments down below. And uh, if you were as shocked as I was and clueless, or if you actually had an idea about this accident before, and if you know any more maybe that uh, have happened in the past, you can let me know in the comments and I will definitely check them out. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment down below. Let me know what you thought about this video. It's been Elena, your friendly nuclear physicist. And until next time, see you soon.